Thank you very much, Lucille. Okay, so this morning I'm going to tell you two stories. One's about me and, and my science, and a bit of a story of serendipity, a bit of perseverance, a little few of the things you've already heard today. And the other story is about you, actually, and, and about how you can help uh, move on medical science and, and innovation. So let's start with, with my story. So if I go back about 25 years, um, I was a junior hospital doctor, um, cruising along, enjoying myself, um, but not really quite sure what I wanted to do with myself. I didn't know what speciality I wanted to end up in. I just enjoyed what I did. Um, at that time, I was actually training in renal medicine, just by chance. That's what I was doing. And this brought me into contact on a daily basis with the scientific disciplines I hadn't really thought about since medical school, because it was so difficult. And that was immunology. Now, the reason I was uh, introduced to immunology, I guess there were two reasons. One was that I was seeing patients every day with kidney disease, whose disease was really driven by what we now call autoimmunity. Their immune system that should have been fighting infections and bacteria for reasons that we still don't understand very well, was sort of turning inwards and, and attacking their owner. And on the kidney ward, you saw patients with kidney failure because of this sort of disease, things like lupus, vasculitis. You may have heard of some of these conditions. That was one thing. The other thing, sort of paradoxically, was on the transplant ward, where I saw patients who had had kidney failure, perhaps due to lupus, and now they had a transplant. And actually, it was the immune system that was now attacking the transplant. In this situation, the immune system was doing what it meant to do. It was attacking something that was foreign. But of course, from the patient's perspective, this wasn't very good because they wanted to keep that kidney. They didn't want to reject it. So, so there were two instances where I saw the immune system in action. And what did we do with those patients? Well, in those days, we gave them a cocktail, and to an extent we still do, a cocktail of not very nice drugs, things like steroids, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide. And we tried to reverse this... The, these, these dilemmas. And the, the drugs worked, actually, to a great extent. So we could usually suppress the immune system in lupus. We could reverse patients' kidney failure, or their, their transplant rejection. The problem was we did it by what I would call blanket immunosuppression. So we suppressed the immune system pretty much in its entirety. And that meant the patients then got horrible infections because their immune system couldn't do the job it was meant to do, and they got virus infections and bacterial infections. And sometimes they died of those infections. So we needed new drugs, we needed new concepts in, in, in immunology to, to really treat immune disorders. And because of this, I was introduced with one, to one of my great mentors, Herman Waldman, who was working in Cambridge. And Herman, with other people around the world, were working on a concept called immune reprogramming or immune re-education. And this was a, real, a really neat idea. And like many great ideas, it was relatively simple. The immune system itself is very complex, so, and one of the reasons is it's everywhere. It's in your blood, it's in your lymph glands, it's in your spleen, it's in the lining of your bowel, it's in the lining of your lung, it's in your skin. It's absolutely everywhere, so it's a really hard organ to work with. But what the immune reprogrammers were doing, they were saying, well, the immune system is actually quite straightforward. It's a collection of cells, but they're coordinated like any army by one particular cell. So this is meant to be a joint here in the middle of the picture. So you may not want to come up to me as a rheumatologist if you think this is what I think a joint looks like, but that's what a joint looks like. And, and the immune system is coordinated by these cells called helper T cells, which I call the generals of the immune system. And they really instruct the rest of the immune system what to do, the B cells, the cytotoxic T cells, the macrophages. And here they're destroying a joint in, in a situation a little bit like rheumatoid arthritis. And what the immune reprogrammers were saying was, well, if we could develop drugs which targeted those helper T cells and told them, if you like, to change their minds and to switch off, then everything else should follow. And there were some really remarkable things going on in the, in the labs at the time. So you could cure animals of lupus. You could actually cure them with just a couple of weeks of treatment with drugs called monoclonal antibodies, which targeted these helper T cells. You could take an animal that was rejecting a transplant, not only stop the transplant rejection, but make the immune system change its mind so that it started to believe the transplant was self. So after two or three weeks of treatment, it no longer rejected, and that animal would live forever with a foreign organ. I found this really remarkable. And so this was, in a sense, the first part of my journey. I'd found an area that I wanted to um, develop. I was interested in pharmacology. I wanted to work with drugs, but I wanted to work with new drugs, something very, very different, and I thought this was it. I suppose the problem was that this is all, at the stage, this was all in animals and, and laboratory models. Nothing had gone into patients yet. And this is where the patient that changed my life comes into it. So I was working in kidney medicine. I'd gone to Cambridge to work with Herman Walden, actually, to do my PhD. And I was working with another inspirational um, mentor called Martin Lockwood, who was one of the kidney docs in Cambridge. I'd worked with him in London, and we'd both moved to Cambridge together. 
And I went on a ward round with him one day, and, and I met a patient called Nicola, who at that stage was about uh, 1920, and she'd been ill for many, many years with an immune disease that we didn't really understand. We didn't know what it was. She'd been very, very sick. She'd had all the drugs really known to man in terms of immune suppression on their own and in combinations, and she wasn't doing very well. And in fact, the first time I saw her, she was unconscious. She was on so many painkillers that she really uh, was doing very badly indeed. And I'm going to show you a couple of video clips now. One of Nicola's mum, and that's been anonymized for Nicola's mum's uh, personal choice, and then one of Nicola. So let's listen to Nicola's mum first. This was a few years ago. How long has she been in hospital at that stage? Do you remember? Uh, she'd been in for, I think, almost nine months. Continuously? Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. Um, because every time she got ready to go home, she was poorly again. Um, what, what were the, was it, it was this rip, the pain under the ribs? Terrible the pain, thing, wasn't it? swelling joints, temperatures, just generally really, really unwell. Okay. Um, you could never pinpoint anything, it was just a mass of symptoms, right. um, which couldn't be explained. They didn't fall into any particular mm -hmm. box. Okay, and, and that's Nicola's mum, and here's Nicola as well. This was again taken a few years back. So you got Tempas? Yeah. How did that go? Do you remember the infusions or...? No, because at that time I was... Um, I'd hit a crisis point really, and apparently they called mum and dad in to tell them that um, I wasn't going to make it, and that's when Dr Lockwood came up and um, asked them if he could, could give me Campath for the first time. Mm. So I don't remember having it, um, okay. but all I do remember is all of a sudden, you know, waking up and things were very different. What, um, what had changed? I, I could move. <laughs> okay. And um, I just felt different. Um, I hadn't got the level of pain that I'd had before. Um, and it was quite confusing to go from being unable to move and being in that level of pain to all of a sudden waking up and not having that. Yeah. So, yeah. so for me, that was a light bulb moment, really. Um, Nicola had failed on all these conventional immunosuppressive drugs, and suddenly there was a very specific drug that had really saved her life. And, and it hadn't cured her, as, as you'll see, but, but it had made a huge difference. And I thought, well, actually, this is where I, what I want to do. Um, this is where I want to be. The problem for me, I suppose, is did I want to hang my whole career on a very, very rare patient in, in, a, in a unique situation? And, and that was difficult. I spoke to a few people and said, well, you need to be careful because, you know, fortunately, patients like Nicola are rare. You don't see patients like this every day. Um, and so if you want to develop a new sort of treatment, maybe you should be looking at other sorts of disease areas. So I went back to the books. I went back to my medical school books and thought, well, where do I think the immune system is doing most damage in terms of patients? And I came across another disease which I thought was immune-mediated. It wasn't completely clear at the time. It didn't kill people in, in the same way as vasculitis, which Nicola probably had, but it took away their lives. It stopped them working. It took away their social lives. It made them dependent on others often. And there weren't any treatments. And that, that disease was rheumatoid arthritis. So I started doing rheumatology clinics in Cambridge with, with another mentor, Brian Hazelman. And when I think back, 25 years, um, not that long ago, I would say one in three patients would turn up to the clinic in a wheelchair. Most of them had lost their jobs within a few months of the illness starting. They'd lost their social lives. Many of them were dependent on their relatives to look after them. They couldn't shop. They couldn't do very much. And there weren't many drugs. There were three or four drugs which we would cycle through. And usually by five years into the disease, we'd got to the end, and there wasn't much else out there for those patients. So I spoke to Herman Walden. I said, why don't we try Campath? in rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not sure it's an immune disease in, the, in that sort of sense, but I think it's worth a shot. And now I'm going to show you a video of one of the very first patients that we treat with Campath. And as you'll see, this was taken 25 years ago. Jenny, these are your thermography images from today. And I think we can see at least two big differences since before treatment. The first is that before, there is a lot of red on the image. And as you remember, red means hot, and particularly around the wrists and the fingers. Today, if you look at today's image, they're still slightly yellow in those areas, but there really is a considerable change. So, Jenny, do these thermography changes correspond with how you're feeling now? Oh, yes, it's made a tremendous difference. The swelling has all gone down. Uh, I've got a wide range of movements in my fingers. Uh, I can do all sorts of things that I couldn't do before I had the treatment. What sorts of things are you able to do now? 
Well, I can uh, manage to cope with my hair and put my makeup on and uh, been able to carry on with my sugar craft. So that was 25 years ago, and that was kind of the end of my first story. I'd, I'd found the area of research I wanted to be involved in. I'd found a disease that was going to occupy me for the, last, for the next 25 years. Um, and that's really what I've been doing since, is developing immune therapies for rheumatoid. But I told you the second part of the story was about you and, and how you can make a big difference. And maybe it won't be you. I'm talking really about patients in general. And yes, Campath was a good treatment for Jenny. It, it did a lot of things for Nicola. It wasn't the answer. Um, so when I do a rheumatology clinic now, when I see rheumatoid arthritis patients, we have four of these immune-targeted therapies. Only one of them is a little bit like Campath, but there has been a revolution in drugs that target the immune system. And many of my patients now, uh, most of them are still in, in work. Most of them don't lose their jobs. Most of them have a social life. Some of them have no symptoms at all, and some of them we can even stop their drugs. So there have been huge advances. But one of the nice things about the human race is that we're all very different. And if you look around the room, everybody here is different. There's no identical twins, I hope. But apart from that, we're different people. And what that means is when you get sick, you behave differently. Your, your illness behaves differently. And so for every five or six patients I see in my clinic who are doing really well, there will still be one or two who are doing really badly. Despite all these modern treatments, they'll still cycle through them. And sadly, they just don't respond. And we don't understand that still. So when I'm sitting in my clinic room with one of those patients, there's two things going through my mind, really. One is the doctor in me thinking, what treatment can I use for this patient? Is there anything I've missed out? Is there any combination I should be do using? What can I do to get this patient better? There's got to be something. That's the first thing. The second thing is, well, why are they different? What, what's different about this patient? What's different about their disease? Have I got the diagnosis right? But if I have, why are they not responding to these treatments, which most of my patients do respond to? And I think what the patient doesn't realize is they are the owner of an incredibly precious resource, a hugely pre um, precious resource. I work in a field called translational medicine, which we sometimes call bench to bedside research. And what I need is to understand how that patient's body is working, their joints are working. So I need samples from the patient, so I need ideas from the patient. So in, you know, in the simplest terms, a little bit of extra blood will help my research. Um, a bit more complicated, we can take some fluid from their joints or some joint lining. Um, or they could just tell me what they're feeling. And I've, I feel that every patient that walks through the door of my clinic has something to help, something to add. And I don't really think patients understand that. And they don't understand that because I don't think the general population understands that before they become patients. And that's what I call a translational partnership. I really believe if we're going to cure diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Patients and researchers have to work together as partners on our voyage to discovery to better understand these diseases. I talked about the immune army. I guess what I'm talking about here is an army of patients and researchers working together to fight those diseases. Um, and, you know, in the word of our political partners, we can do that better together. Um, so I talk about the general public. What I would like is when patients come to the clinic, really for the first time, so really you need to understand this as a member of the general public before you become a patient, if you're gonna become a patient. I want you to understand that actually you have loads to offer in terms of research. We work very well in partnerships in terms of the clinic, so nurses and doctors working together, but this is about patients working with doctors and scientists. And I want you to come to my clinic engaged and excited and understanding our journey, understanding how you could help. And as I say, that might be just giving a little bit of extra blood. It might be giving a bit of your joint tissue, which actually is a pretty painless procedure these days. You have to believe me on that one, but it is. Or it may just be filling in a questionnaire. But I'd like to think that everybody that walks through the door of my clinic recognizes that they are a challenge to me, to medical research. And actually, they can really help in a very, very big way in, in, in progressing in, 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 in medical progress. And that's, that's my concept of this translational partnership, which we're trying to develop in Newcastle right now with initiatives. So I hope you'll see this in, in months and years to come. So that's my second story. That's how you, particularly if you become patients, can help. But actually, we need the general public to help as well, because, of course, before you become ill, there are things you can do as well. And, and you will have heard of initiatives um, like Biobank, where, where your, your questions and your samples can help. But what about Nicola? Well, Campath wasn't the answer. I mean, I think it did change her life. I think, I think it did save her life, probably. And she's gone on over the years to, to receive many more immunotherapies. Sadly, she wasn't cured, and she still had many problems in, in years to come. 
But if you really want to understand Nicola, I'm very grateful for her because she's come here today and she's sitting over here in the front row at the edge. And she's agreed to talk to people over coffee if you'd like to hear her story, hear about some of the drugs that she's received. So I just want to say to Nicola, actually, thank you very much. Um, as you probably realise, your, your story did change my life. Um, and I hope I've changed your life. Thank you very much.